Welcome to The Beat, a news and talk program brought to you by the Center for Community Media at Worcester State University. I'm your host, Molly Hughes, and today we'll be interviewing film director Pola Rappaport. Pola, thank you for so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Molly. Because it's fresh in our minds, I would love to chat about your newest film, Addicted to Life, which we just screened here at Worcester State. For our audience who wasn't there um, at the screening, could you just tell us a little bit about this documentary? Okay, uh, Addicted to Life um, is a feature-length documentary. Um, it's about a female character named Marika Vervoort. She mm -hmm. was a Belgian Paralympic athlete who did wheelchair racing uh, as her final sport in her life. She had done triathlons. And um, it's the story of the last three years of her life during which uh, we filmed her. And she had decided in Belgium that she would take advantage of the law that permits a person who is, who is uh, fatally ill to choose medical aid in dying as a mm -hmm. way that they will die. And the, so the film really is about how she seized life in her last uh, period of time, the last three years. She was only 37 mm -hmm. when we started, and she wanted to seize, uh, get every moment of life out of it and lived much, much longer than anyone had predicted. Mm -hmm. And you know, Marika in general, you know, why she was such a champion, and why do you think it was so important for her to tell her story? She, um, the, the, the way in which she was a champion, she had won since 2007, I believe, uh, or 2006, she had started winning world championships in triathlon mm -hmm. and, uh, and then moved over to wheelchair racing. Um, she knew from around the age of 27 that, um, that she had a very, very rare disease that affected her spine mm -hmm. that had begun to paralyze her from the feet up. And it's, it's very rare. When I first researched it, it's called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. They, someone said to me, oh, probably four people in the whole country of Belgium have mm -hmm. it. It's quite rare. Um, and so, but the prognosis generally is it will eventually paralyze you and kill you. And she was only, 14 when she began to feel the effects of this. And um, so she, uh, she, because she had become hopeless about her condition in her late 20s and was actually contemplating suicide because mm -hmm. she was afraid she'd have to give up sports, which gave her so much pleasure mm -hmm. and she was so good at it, swimming and I, all these sports that she undertook, even in this half paralyzed state, when a waist paralyzed mm -hmm. from the waist down, um, she became, she said herself, suicidal at one point. And w she was going to therapy and the therapist said to her, you know, we have a law here in Belgium um, that will enable you, uh, when you feel that your condition is so unbearable because she suffered a lot of pain mm -hmm. on a regular basis, if, when it becomes too unbearable, you can enlist a doctor who's a specialist at, at this to help you with the process of dying. Mm -hmm. So Marika went to see a doctor who, in fact, Wim Distelmans is the chief, he's the head of the Federal Euthanasia Commission, so to say, in, Fr in Belgium. And um, he said to her, Marika, you're nowhere near ready to die. You have mm -hmm. so much life left in you, but when the time comes, I will help you with this. Mm -hmm. And it was like a light went off in her head and it changed her life so, mm -hmm. so radically and so, um, powerfully in that moment when she suddenly realized, I don't have to worry about how I'm going to die. I just have to make my plans about how I'm going to live. Mm -hmm. So she was in this like existential crisis, sort of, that became an amazing opportunity yes. to see how she could, with the greatest humor and the greatest joie de vivre, live her life um, to the absolute maximum and to the best, in spite of the pain, in spite of the disability. She decided that's not gonna stop me, it's gonna limit me, but I'm gonna make the most of things. And she started to create a bucket list. And on it, one of the things was getting into the Paralympics and she got in. So she basically lived for almost 12 more years after this um, occasion when she learned about the euthanasia law and got her papers in order much, much, much longer than she thought she could mm -hmm. live. 
and she lived in many ways a very full life and a wonderful life and, um, and a, kept on adding things to the bucket list so that she could live to the max. And at one point, three, uh, when she was 37, she had just done her second Paralympics. She, she won gold in London in 2012. I hadn't heard about her. I didn't follow the Paralympics mm -hmm. at the time. And in 2016, I happened to see an article in the New York paper about her. Um, not that she was the most outstanding athlete of the Paralympics. She won silver and bronze. Uh, uh, she won several uh, medals in the, in the Rio de Janeiro Paralympics. But she gave a press conference at which she spoke about the fact that she had these papers that allowed her to die by euthanasia when the time was to come. And she said, the time has not yet come. I'm going to retire from top sports now after 15 years or so of being in top sports. Um, but I'm going to live my life to the maximum. And euthanasia is not murder, as some people call it. And it's not suicide. It keeps people from committing suicide. I read this article. I thought, this is such a fascinating microcosm of an existential question. And then I, I Googled around, and on YouTube, I found a video of this press conference. And I was completely captivated by this young woman who was funny and beautiful and, and so passionate about the fact that she wanted to get this word out to the world. And then I began to pursue her and got in touch with her and said to her, I think this might make an interesting documentary. Mm -hmm. And she was absolutely into it. I think she loved the idea that this message she wanted to, to put out was going to be heard in a, doc, in a bigger documentary from the United States. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, we worked together for the mm -hmm. next three years, filming her until the night that she did finally die by mm -hmm. euthanasia. Yeah, and I think um, your film really shows how that her character and that change in her character and how amazing she was. You know, do you feel like because of how challenging this movie was to create, did you feel a change in yourself at all? Did I feel a change in myself? Um, I feel like I'm always sort of trying to grow and reorient myself to, to, to a kind of philosophical and, and real life understanding of what my life is going to be. And Marika, having had this existential issue so prominently in her, in her um, the situation in which she found herself highlighted that for me. So yes, I think she was kind of like a teacher and a guide mm -hmm. for me. And I hope in the course, in the, when people see the film, that she will kind of serve that function that I think she wanted to serve. Like, wake up, guys. Mm -hmm. It's your life. Live it. You know? OK, you might be, I'm disabled. I'm in horrible pain. I'm probably more in pain than any of you will be. But look what I'm doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, wake up to the moment. And as much as possible, live your lives, I mean, because people forget, you know, uh, in the day-to-day -day business of life. And, and she always was saying to people, please stop complaining. I mean, you're alive, you're healthy, you, you know, yeah. find, seize the next moment. So it, she, she was an amazing teacher yeah. in that way without ever being didactic. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And, and she had a hell of a lot of humor. <laughs> she made everybody laugh. I was laughing her. the whole movie. She was Were amazing. You? Yes, she was amazing. Yeah, she could be nasty too, yeah. but she had a <laughs> funny nastiness or a nasty funniness about her. She often made people laugh around her. And then, you know, with specifically with euthanasia, did you ever think a lot about euthanasia before meeting Marika? Or were, did your opinions change after, you know, knowing her for so many years? Amali, it's funny that you use the word euthanasia. So this is something I learned when I started to make this movie and started looking for funding. Euthanasia is a big no-no of a term in America. Mm -hmm. It happens to be used in Belgium because they speak Dutch, uh, French and Dutch, and uh, both the French and the Dutch in Belgium call it that. It, it comes from the Greek. It means a good death. And um, in Amer in, around the world, generally, it's called medical aid in dying. Mm -hmm. So euthanasia has taken on kind of a, a, a dirty, like a dirty word in America. And the laws that have been really rapidly changing in the states of the US um, never, never use that word. They use medical aid and dying for the most part, which is much more, um, it's, it's the right term to use in English. Um, 
euthanasia is used for animals, but there's a, the people, there's a group called Compassion and Choices that has become the biggest advocacy group in America to change the legislatures of the states to enable people to have medical aid in dying. So far there's 10 states that have allowed it, and it's in the Massachusetts legislature now, um, and in the New York legislature. New York doesn't allow it. And then the uh, Washington, District of Columbia as well. Um, but in Compassion and Choices, I think it's there that I've seen this funny phrase, please let me die like a dog, because dogs are allowed to have euthanasia mm -hmm. and die in a kind way. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a joke, but yeah, why are we keeping someone who's very ill, knows they're gonna die, and wants to do it in the smoothest, cleanest, mm -hmm. most least painful for themselves and their loved ones? Why are we keeping them from doing it? Uh, that was always my philosophy. Yeah. And I already had heard of Compassion and Choices probably 10 years before I met Marika through a very elderly friend of mine who was a great film enthusiast. Uh, he told me about it and I thought, great work they're doing, yeah. It's kind of like the abortion story. Mm -hmm. Like why should somebody else tell you what to do with your body? Mm -hmm. So I was pretty gung-ho about people being able to do this. Um, but there are many, many forces around the world and in the US that are against it. Um, the Catholic Church, certain other religious groups, the AMA, the American Medical Association, um, has come out and has not changed their position as being against medical aid and dying, mm -hmm. but they're shifting. The world is shifting. It's, in a, it's, it's really a, like a, a big sea change. And when I, when I've, every year when I want to update my facts about this medical aid and dying around mm -hmm. the world, there's been another state that's, that's allowed it. There's mm -hmm. been another country. So, at the moment, there's four heavily Catholic countries that permit medical aid and dying. Um, Colombia, Spain, Portugal, Italy. And then there's countries like France that don't allow it, mm -hmm. although it's in the legislature. And the US has not permitted it uh, uh, nationwide. So, but, but you can see the, the cultural shift around it. And little by little, the voices of what I consider progress are, the voices of progress are moving toward allowing people the freedom to do what they, they're, they're not saying to somebody else, you've got to die mm -hmm. with a, by a doctor helping, giving, or getting medication. No, it's about your own mm -hmm. self-determination. And the amazing thing about it, which I learned during this film, is it has lightened the spirits of so many people. All the doctors that I've spoken to who are experts in this field have told me that the, and it happened with Marika, yeah. the light in their eyes changes, it comes back and suddenly they realize, I don't have to worry about dying like a horribly long, painful death. I'm gonna be helped with this. And it has made people's lives so much better. Even many, many people in the US who sign up for it don't go through with it, they die mm -hmm. naturally. But the end of their lives is greatly improved. And Marika's story, when the day that my husband, who's the cinematographer on the film, uh, Wolfgang Held, when we went there just to meet her, to see on a test shoot, is this woman gonna be good for a movie? The way she described her feeling, she, she goes, it was like, boof, my whole life changed. And I was so moved by that, and so I just felt like, it's like a light opened up for mm -hmm. her in her spirit. And I mean, you can see this is the right thing for people who want to do this, and I don't think that the government should prevent people. I think mm -hmm. the government should permit it, yeah. 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 Um, you know, you've talked in previous interviews how you work more based on emotion rather than journalistic tactic, and I really feel like that came through mm -hmm. in this movie. You know, do you mean for this film to shape public opinion? Well, great question, Molly. I have always felt that with documentary, if you can move an audience, then you're probably going to get them to feel the subject of your film, whether it be political or cultural or whatever, great in a greater way. And the more personal you make it, the more they will be moved. Mm -hmm. So I have never made a film of my own. I have worked on some as an editor that are more about issue, issue oriented. But with this film, even though it's, it, it heavily deals with the issue of um, palliative care, not so much that, but medical aid and dying, it's a, it's a portrait of a very strong character who happens to have characteristics that I hope will move and affect audiences so that when they think about it vis-a-vis in, -vis in regards to other people, 
they'll think perhaps of Marika and how this permission from the government of Belgium improved her life so greatly in the last 12 years of her life, mm -hmm. and that they'll think, yeah, maybe it's not for everyone, but I am in favor of the government not preventing people from making this extremely important life and death mm -hmm. choice. So yes, I don't choose journalism as the way to get to it. I feel yeah, this way to get to this is through a, a s very strong personal character, mm -hmm. ideally someone with a sense of humor who can you know, yeah. imbue the film with emotion that yeah, the audience absolutely. will then, it'll transmit to an audience. So. so I'd love to just talk a little bit about how the response to the film has been in America versus Europe. So mm -hmm. I know that you know, Europe has a little bit of a different idea of, about euthanasia. We did talk about how there's, you know, Christian nations, whatever, but America definitely is a little bit more negative towards the idea of, of euthanasia and everything. So what has the response been to the film where it's been screened? Well, I have to correct you. I don't think America mm -hmm. is more against it. America, they've been doing it state by state. Mm -hmm. Oregon was first, it's more than 25 years, I think it's getting on 30 years. It took a long time, 12 years for the state of Washington to move over to it. And then little by little, little now there's 10, mm -hmm. plus DC. Um, so we are actually one of the few countries in the world that does allow it okay. in certain circumstances in certain states. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, I didn't, I should have, I meant to count them. There are about maybe 12 countries that range from Australia and New Zealand down here to Canada went over, I think, in 2017. Canada is one of the more liberal. It started with uh, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg. Um, Switzerland was very early. Um, my experience, because Marika was Belgian, uh, and I had spel spent some time in Belgium, like er, not, not living there, but I had a lot of friends there. I had some contacts there. Um, and I found a fantastic co-producer there named Mark Dames uh, uh, in Antwerp, a company called Associate Directors. He came on within the first year of my attempting to do this movie, helped us raise money, and, um, and he took on the promotion of the film in Belgium and he got a wonderful theatrical release. It was in every newspaper when the film opened. It was just about a year ago. Uh, I went over, we did interviews on every TV station. They really embraced this mm -hmm. film and Marika is a beloved star there. Um, she's Because she won gold medals, silver and bronze, for the country of Belgium, mm -hmm. which is a tiny country, yeah. right, in the Paralympics. Um, so she's very loved, and in the film you see her getting awards from the King and Queen of Belgium, uh, King Philippe. Um, so Belgium, those countries clearly have embraced, uh, well, Belgium in particular, this film. On the other hand, um, it's, it, it and it, our U.S. premiere was in Oregon, in Portland, at mm. the Portland Film Festival, and they particularly loved the film, partly because they are pioneers in yeah. the U.S. in permitting this, so it was very issue-oriented for them. Um, on the other hand, particularly, I think, since the pandemic, it can be difficult to get streamers, for instance, programmers, um, the gatekeepers, to embrace a film that deals with death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even though people seem to love murder, you know, <laughs> that's the biggest thing on streamers, but when it's a documentary dealing with death, it can be more difficult to mm -hmm. get it across. So, you know, it hasn't been 100% like, wow, everybody's mm -hmm. seeing the movie yet. We have a wonderful sales agent in Great Britain who's promoting it at film markets. Um, but I think certainly, uh, I mean, it raises a lot of issues and we haven't yet, uh, the sales agent is working on all these countries. And I'm hoping that we get a big um, TV sale in France, for instance, and Germany, where Germany just approved medical aid and dying. Mm -hmm. It's still, the law has to be written, but the courts have approved it. Um, we, you know, I definitely would be very, very happy to have these bigger countries in Europe and to have Australia embrace the film and have it accessible, if not through a theatrical release, which I'm not really counting on outside of Belgium, but through television streamers, etc. Mm -hmm. So the sales agent, that's their expertise. Mm -hmm. um, and let's hope they do a great job. But with the audiences that have seen it, it's been an overwhelmingly positive yeah. response, which I have been incredibly gratified. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to Marika for being willing to share her this once in a lifetime journey, and it was once in a lifetime for me too. I don't think I'll ever be in that situation again, mm -hmm. making a documentary about somebody who is 
going to let us go through with them to the end of their yeah. life. I mean, it's like an incredible privilege to be part of that and to be to know that she trusted me and and Wolfgang that we were going to do an honest portrayal. We discussed all the details. I discussed all the details with her over the course of our three-year relationship, how I was going to handle the journey and the death. And we even thought, maybe she's not going to die. Maybe we'll get the money to finish this movie before she has to mm -hmm. die. Maybe, and I used to say to her, can you imagine coming to the premiere, how cool <laughs> it will be? Like, you'll come out on your wheelchair on stage. It took so long to do the film and she lasted three more years after I met her. Mm -hmm. um, so in fact, it's a natural ending of the film to have Marika's life end. It was a clear narrative, because as a filmmaker with documentary, you're writing it in the edit room, and you need to find a trajectory where, with a beginning, middle, end, where the audience feels like they've come on a journey with you and the protagonist, and they have a feeling of completion at the end. So this gave us a natural ending, of course. Um, but that's the task of the director. In this case, I was the editor as well to find the way to kind of complete the, the trip. You know, you mm -hmm. want to make it feel like, oh, yeah. I got to know this person. Oh, I went through this with them. Oh, this happened, that happened. Ah, at the end, mm -hmm. I'm with them. I'm in the cry a lot of people are crying at the end um, because of the loss of her, or the somehow this it's a it's pretty moving to watch the film. Absolutely, so yeah. I was definitely in tears at the end, um, especially when uh, we got to that point where the the bright light happens and the, she's bungee jumping and you know running around in her wheelchair, exactly how she directed you to end the movie, which I just thought was so amazing. She's such a confident, you know, interesting person, you know. Um, adding to the filmmaking process mm -hmm. and you know we showed this at um, a college today uh, so you know do you have any uh, thing to say to you know college students about how you became inspired to become a filmmaker oh wow well I do now teach at NYU for the last five years I have a wonderful gig where I sight and sound I went to NYU as a 17 year old straight out mm -hmm. of high school when it was predominantly male and anyway, Sight and Sound is this sophomore year undergrad class where you make like five films in the mm -hmm. semester. So my task is in the documentary group to counsel the students on their editing to make their films better. Um, and it's really fun to be around these young film students. So I was very lucky. I was a New York City kid. And my high school, I went to a wonderful high school and they brought in a filmmaker uh, to kind of mentor three students of whom I was one. My old friend Millie Ayatru, who was one of the others, has been nominated twice for an Oscar for uh, in the realm of sound that she moved into. I've made a lot of films over this period of time since I was 16, basically. Um, so uh, there's a lot of stuff I haven't learned and some stuff I wish I had pursued. Like I've never been shooting three camera setups <laughs> like this, you know? Um, and I'm always like, how do they do that? It looks so cool. Um, but. I think basically to stick with filmmaking, you have to have like a will of steel mm -hmm. and great passion about your subject because it's just too damn hard otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I gotta say, when you're there, like I've had this experience many times since my film Broken Meat in 1990, that was the first one that really had big exposure. It was about a mad poet. And we took it to International Documentary Film Festival, Amsterdam, IDFA, that's become like the biggest doc festival in the world now. And it was one of the three prize winners. And sitting there at the, at the screening and the Q&A, when people like are moved and love your film and there's an amazing Q&A, there's like nothing like yeah. it. It is such a high. <laughs> it is so much fun to share this thing that you've been working on for like a, either a few months to a period of years. Mm -hmm. It can be years. Um, some people that I've worked with, it's been over 10 years, and then you're sharing this hour long or hour and a half long thing with people and, and they get your spark. Mm -hmm. It's worth it, yeah. it is worth it, yeah. you know? It's worth not making a lot of money, you know? It can be hard to raise the funds, there's a lot of drawbacks, but you meet the most amazing people mm -hmm. and it's sort of like, each film, I mean, I did one other film on a sportswoman, Nadia Komanich, and that was an amazing adventure. 
although she didn't participate. It was based on uh, archival footage. Mm -hmm. But the other films have been on extremely varied stories. Mm -hmm. um, one about the woman that wrote the famous erotic novel, mm -hmm. Story of O, a French woman who was in her 90s when I met her um, and revealed her true, true self. Mm -hmm. I did a film, I discovered I had a secret Romanian half-brother from my father who we never knew about, Family Secret. And that, the response to that at the screenings was unbelievable mm -hmm. because all these people would come out of the audience at the end and say, you know, I discovered I had this, this uncle that no one ever talked about. They had all, yeah. so many people had yeah. a family secret. So you're connecting with people on this, you know, you, you've been in this thing and tried to beautify it and make it as wonderful and great as possible in the course of the editing. And even if your footage has problems, you know, you really kill yourself in the editing to just get the best place. So every cut makes sense. And then they love it. If they love it, which they often do, you just feel like, oh my God, you, you know, your heart is, it's like you've made this heart connection. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. Yeah. So that's, I guess, what I would say. Yeah. I would also say something I've said to the kids at NYU, marry a really good cinematographer or editor because <laughs> Wolfgang has gone on a lot of these journeys yeah. with me and oh my God, what a collaborator. Yeah. He has become, he's, you know, he's one of the best. And uh, you know, you gotta surround yourself with people that support you yes. and. Absolutely. You know, you know, you've worked as director, you've worked as producer, you've worked as editor um, for many films. Um, so you, for this one, I did to delight, you took a majority of creative roles. Do you have a preference on anything? Um, making your own movie, d directing it is like, there's just nothing better. But as editor, I've worked in many cases very closely. I haven't worked on a lot of TV stuff. I've worked on independent documentaries mostly and you know, when you connect with the filmmaker, with the director, and you, you really have a great communication and artistically you can kind of work toward a goal and she's got an idea and you've got an idea or he's got an idea and then they, it's like, oh yeah, that, oh, what, and that, or you do something and they're like, oh my God, I never realized it could be that way. And then that's a great relationship and very creative. I really think the editing, the, writing of documentary is done in the cutting room. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's an idea, but you go out, you don't necessarily know what you're gonna get, and so you need to write it, and yeah. that's a great adventure, too. So, Paula, thank you so much. Um, where can we find your movies, and is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience today that we haven't covered? No. <laughs> well, there's two websites. Um, I have an odd spelling of my name, but one of them is www.polarapaport.com, P-O-L-A-R-A-P-A-P-O-R-T. Um, Addicted to Life is the name of the film, and if you Google Addicted to Life, uh, that would come up, and the website of the movie, marikathefilm.com. And um, so my films are available, the Nadia Komenich film is available on Amazon. Uh, I did a film on Hair, the musical, I, you'd probably need to contact me for some of these films mm -hmm. uh, through my website, but I'd be happy to sell streams or copies, and I'd love to share them with the audiences here in Worcester and thank beyond. Thank you so much. So, Molly, yeah. thank you for having me. Thank yeah, you so no, it's, much. It's been great. Thank you. This is the first institution outside of NYU where I have oh, shown awesome. the film. We're going. On, I'm going on a tour this this uh, week, that this month actually, that's been organized by Professor Jeffrey Gerson at UMass Lowell. He's been incredibly generous working this out, so we'll be showing it, in fact, at uh, Brown University Med School mm -hmm. uh, in a couple of weeks and at Lowell and a couple of others. So, um, yeah, we're hoping, I think the film will have a life, uh, an edu is educational screenings like this, which are extremely rewarding. We had a great turnout today here at Worcester and, um, I could see that these young audiences seem to be very engaged and mm -hmm. it was a great audience so it was a super nice opportunity and thank you for having me here at the beat and thank to the, thanks to the university and Professor Daniel yeah. Pond for organizing it so yeah it was a great experience. All right. Thank you for watching the beat. This segment is a uh, please <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you for watching this segment of the beat. Uh, please follow us on social media and we will see you next time.